Okay, so let's start the class. If you have any question, uh, do not hesitate. And now we are going over his story, which should be interesting because most of you are not science majors. So his story is great, it's very interesting. So we have reached the great uh, Newton, Isaac Newton. Okay, um, he was British, obviously. And he's the one who wrote, uh, and it's always a question on the test one, um, the book, the book he wrote was called Principia. So at the time, physics was not a thing. It was just uh, natural science, right? But this book, okay, it's the most famous book in physics and in science because it's, it's uh, laying out all the foundation of science. So it lay out the foundation for uh, physics, obviously, mechanics, and then uh, on that is based the technology that we use today and the biotechnology and the chemistry. Anything science is based on the principles that Newton developed in this book. So it was written in uh, 17 something, 17, uh, 17th century for sure so it was 1670 okay you have to check i forgot the date uh, why it doesn't say here Sixteen. I cannot forget i forgot uh, 1670 something okay it was written and in his book, he lay out the three laws of motion. And of course, he developed the universal um, universal law of, of gravity, the universal law of gravitation. Okay? So uh, as I told you before, he didn't publish this book first. Okay? He didn't want to pay for the publication. And it was his only friend, as we know of, Haley, Edmund Haley, who asked Newton, uh, you know, there is this comet, and every 76 years, this comet comes back to visit us, to visit the Earth. Why, why so? How come the, the, the comet seems to be glued to, to the sun? And uh, apparently Newton said, oh, I, I figured this out 20 years ago. And so it had to be Edmund Haley, who was, who was like a wealthy merchant, who paid for the publication. Otherwise, we will not have the physics. Maybe that we have today, if, we, if there was not another Newton. Yes. Helicomet, exactly. Exactly, we're going to talk about that. Helicomet. Helicomet was uh, uh, seen over history, and we'll talk about that. But it's Edmund Haley who understood that it was coming, it was the same one coming every 76 years. He predicted that, but he died before it came back. So we'll talk about that. So anyway, in that book, and I took notes here to make sure that I don't forget everything because you have a lot of things to say about Newton. So he, he developed his universal, uh, universal law of gravitational. Of, of gravity, okay? So it's the, what it's called, universal law of gravitation, okay, developed by Newton. So he understood that you have this kind of glue, okay, that glue us to the earth, that glue the earth around the sun, that glue the sun around the center of the Milky Way, that glue the Milky Way, okay, to the other galaxies in our local group, that glue, this local group. Sorry. I'm not sick. <laughs> I'm very sensitive to dust. Okay. So that glue, 
that he called gravity. So glue our local group to the Virgo cluster, for example, and then it glue all those groups here in the super cluster and so forth and so on. So that gravity here, this glue, remember it's what make up these filaments that you find in the universe, filaments where all the galaxies are clumps along, so it makes, it makes like a thread of galaxies, and this gravity is provided by dark matter. But that was discovered much, much later. So Newton understood that the force that brings the apple, an apple, for example, toward the Earth, so the, the apple is falling because it's acted upon by gravity, is going to be the same force that uh, pull the moon toward the Earth, right? So actually, and, and it was a genius, he was a genius, of course, he understood that actually the, the moon is actually falling toward the Earth. It's constantly falling toward the Earth, but it never, never reaches the Earth, right? Because it has some initial momentum. So both apples or moons, you know, they are, they are all falling. So he kind of uh, unified gravity on Earth and gravity in the heaven. He came up with gravity, and he was also was able to show that. Um, so, before talking about that, I just want you to I want to show you a very famous picture from his book that he drew. He drew himself. He understood that. Like, let's say you take an apple, okay, and instead of dropping the apple. You, you give it an initial momentum, initial velocity. So probably it will, come, and, and this is from a very high mountain. So if, if the velocity is not large enough, okay, it's going to fall, of course. It's called a par, um, projectile motion. So it's going to follow a parabola. But if you give the apple, for example, a large enough speed, what it's going to do, it wants to fall, it keeps falling, but it's never reaching the Earth, right? Because actually, it's like the Earth is curving away. So he's the one who understood orbits, right? So today, if we have a satellite and you want to have the satellite in orbit around the Earth, all you have to do here is to give it enough velocity, okay? So it is falling, but it never reached the Earth. Okay, so that was a huge, huge breakthrough at the time. Obviously, <laughs> he was a genius. He also understood that gravity follows what is called the inverse square law. So what does it mean? It means like if you are on Earth here, let's say you have a truck, and the truck here on Earth is 400 pounds. What does that mean, 400 pounds? It means that the Earth is pulling on that truck with a force of 400 pounds. If you move the truck here and place that truck into orbit, get a distance twice, so twice the radius, do you think the force of gravity will be the same or it's going to be le less? Yes. Very good, it's going to be less, right? And how much, how much more or less? What's the ratio? If you multiply your distance by two, Okay, the force will be divided by four. Therefore, that explains the square. Okay, so if you multiply the distance by two, okay, the weight will be divided by four. So even though it's still a track, the mass of the track didn't change. However, the force acting on the track will be only 100 pounds. And as you move away, so for example, now you multiply the distance by three from the center of the Earth. So the truck will be uh, will be having a, a weight divided by nine. Okay, so if you multiply by four the distance, the weight will be divided by sixteen. Sixteen, very good. What you never get? 
Ian. Ian. Exactly. Okay, so that's what we call the inverse square law. We can understand that with light. Okay, so if you have a source of light here, you see the light will spread out in space. And you're going to have, a, let's say you have a sensor here, and you are collecting some amount of light or photons, like little particle of light, like you have a bucket here, and you collect that many photons here. If you multiply the distance by two, you see that the same energy spread out is spreading out over four times the area. So the thickness here will be divided by four. So four times less light that you gonna collect using the same sensor. You multiply by three, it's gonna be divided by nine. Genius idea, genius understanding. So that works not only for gravity, but it works for any field. So if you have a piece of uranium, for example, or radiation, you have a piece of uranium, as you all know, uranium is radioactive, right? It's radioactive, but the, the radiation will go down very quickly as the square of the distance, okay? So that was a very a big breakthrough. So he developed also at the same time to come to that conclusion, he developed also the three laws of motion, okay? And uh, the first law is called the law of inertia. So it means if you have a spacecraft that you send very far away from the Earth, so that spacecraft will be far away from any planet or star or anything at all, that spacecraft will keep the same speed and the same direction forever after. So um, against Aristotle's idea, you don't need a force for a motion to keep, keep going. Once you push something, okay, it wants to keep going in the same speed, at the, at the, in, in, at the same speed and in the same direction. So that's why if you don't have your seat belt, and you crash, there is an accident and you crash, for example, in, in the car in front of you, the car will stop, but your body will keep moving at the same speed that it was before. And that's why you're gonna, you know, break your neck. That's why you need a seat belt. So it means that if a body in motion will stay in motion at the same speed and in the same direction, unless acted upon by a force. Because many people today, even today, think like Aristotle, that you need a force for something to keep going. Well, something wants to keep going, okay? You really need friction or you need a force to stop it from moving. And then Newton's second law says that if there is a force acting, then you have an acceleration. How much acceleration depends on inertia. For example, today, we know that the universe is accelerating, okay? So we know that the fabric of the universe and the fabric is all around you. You cannot see it with your eyes because we have very poor eyes, very poor sensor, but around us, it's like a fabric, right? Some kind of jello. And, and that fabric is expanding and is expanding at a higher and higher rate. So it's accelerating. So it means if the universe is accelerating, that means you have an acceleration. If you have an acceleration, that means you have a force. And if you have a force, that means somewhere you have energy. So that's what we call dark energy. Another non-intuitive, and, and he built all that uh, using Kepler's law and Galileo uh, kinematics. So he, he he picked up where Galileo left. So Galileo died in 1642, and, and uh, Newton was born Christmas Eve, 1642. So very strange. So anyway, then you have third law that say, for every action, you have an opposite and equal reaction. It's not intuitive, okay? So it means if I were to climb on, on the table here and, and adjust the uh, step out, of course, I'm going to fall, right? My, my weight, let's say my weight is 160 pounds. That means that the earth 
is pulling on me with a force of 160 pounds. I'm gonna accelerate down. But I also pull on the earth with 160 pounds. You have that power. If your weight is 150 pounds, that means that you are pulling on earth with 150 pounds. You cannot have a force uh, action without a reaction. And you cannot be pulled harder than you are um, being pulled. So if I step here, not only the earth is pulling on me with 160 pounds, but I'm pulling on the earth with 160 pounds. Except the earth is not falling toward me, I'm falling toward the earth just because the earth has so much inertia. Okay, so it's not intuitive. So that will be Newton's third law. <laughs> so interestingly, um, the since you know when there is a woman around, <laughs> I like to talk to about that because at the time he didn't have a lot of women in science. So Emily du Châtelet that you see here, she's the one who translated okay, Principia in French. Okay, so Principia was written in England. And a lot of scientists at the time didn't agree with Newton. So she, she, she tried to spread out the ideas of Newton and she's the one who translated the book. And until today, it's still used. So uh, she, she has a very interesting life. Uh, she, she was like a mathematician. She, 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 she could have a lot of freedom at the time, which was not the case for everyone. She's also very famous because uh, for those who study philosophy, she's the, she was the mistress of Voltaire and she had a very uh, understanding husband. Okay, the husband didn't care that she had so many lovers. And uh, so she was the mistress of Voltaire. Voltaire, of course, very famous in France because he's the one who said, I do not agree with you, but I will fight for you to be able to say it. Okay, so it was really the freedom of speech that we forget a lot today. But at the time that was his saying, Voltaire, he got in trouble also with the, with the king and the government of the time. So his name was Voltaire. She died very young. Okay, you can uh, look up her story. Interesting because um, at the time, uh, women, uh, when, when they were um, getting pregnant, and, and, and she was 40 years old when she got pregnant for the last time, she died, okay? So that was a common thing at the time. Uh, she had an affair with an officer and uh, that didn't go well. So she knew that she was about to die because she knew when, when you were pregnant at the time, you had very high probability to die. So she worked day and night to finish her work, translating uh, Principia. So very interesting life. And then she also, um, here, so Newton developed his three laws, the gravity, <clears throat> but if you take a physics class, like very basic physics class, you, you know that you have something called a, a kinetic energy, energy of motion. And, and that kinetic energy, Okay, depends on the speed square. So if you speed up on the highway, you go from, for example, 30 miles per hour to 60 miles per hour. So you multiply your speed by two. Your energy will be multiplied by four. So it means if you crash, okay, if you crash, that means four times more damage, four times more lawsuit or, or insurance. <laughs> going up. So it's a square of the speed. So you multiply your speed by three, okay? The kinetic energy is multiplied by nine. And it will take nine times the distance to stop the car. That's why when you learn driving, they tell you, okay, make, make sure there is a little computation you can make to find out, you know, given my speed, how far I have to stay away from the car in front of it. Because faster you go, uh, more distance it will take to stop you. And those uh, experiments, so this, this kinetic energy was not known by Newton. 
Okay, Newton knew about momentum, but he didn't know about kinetic energy. And, and at the time, they did an experiment here to show that if you multiply the speed by three here, and it's falling into clay, it's going to go nine times in the clay. Okay, so likewise, if you multiply your speed driving by three, it will take you nine times the distance to stop the car. And uh, Emily du Châtelet uh, supported also this idea. Okay, and uh, it was also the idea of uh, someone named Leibniz. So why why do I mention him here, Leibniz? Because Newton, to be able to develop his three laws and to explain Kepler's law as well, he invented calculus. Imagine how smart the guy was. He, he just came up with calculus, right? And he used that as a tool for his uh, principles. And at the time, there was another guy that he really hated. His name was uh, Leibniz. He was uh, a German. And he also said that he invented calculus. So there was a big fight uh, between both of them. And Leibniz also um, against Newton uh, ideas. He also uh, did um, uh, supported the idea of kinetic energy. So Leibniz was really an enemy of Newton. So historians think that really Newton came up with the first, uh, the first, the first one with calculus. But you know there was a saying in science or academia that says publish or perish. Okay, it's really the first one who publish, who get the credit, right? So big, big fight between them. There is also interestingly a fight because Leibniz, who was a mathematician, was a party guy. He liked to party, he liked women, he liked to have fun. And Newton was just the opposite. Okay, he was not a very nice person. He was also a sociopath. He didn't like like many friends, maybe one who was uh, Edmund Halley. Okay, so they really hated each other. So at the time, you could not send email, but they they will write down the mails to each other. Very 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 mean, <laughs> very mean the mails. Okay. So <clears throat> another thing I wanted to tell you is that so Newton didn't have a happy life to begin with. Um, his his dad his dad his dad. Um, died when he was very young. His mom married someone else and left, left his son with his grandmother. So not a happy childhood. He didn't go to school until he was 12, 12 years old, right? He only went to school from 12 years old to 17 years old, okay? And, and other students didn't like him. He was very much into mechanical system, okay? Very interested by science. He left school at 17 years old, and he went back to his uh, mom. The, the, the other guy died, so he went back to his mom. And he was supposed to take care of the farm. Okay, They had a big farm of the family, and he was very bad at it. So his uncle said, OK, he's useless on a farm. Send him to college, OK? So useless people, you know, you send them to college at the time, I guess. So he went to Cambridge. and. Uh, he studied mathematics and he became a professor at Cambridge. Okay, uh, if you go to Cambridge, you can. Uh, uh, I highly recommend that you can visit. It's called so Cambridge is a university and it's made of several little colleges. One of the college it's called Trinity College, and uh, you can see, supposedly, the a piece of the apple tree under which Newton sit down and, and uh, ask about why, why is that the moon is not falling toward the earth, right? So that's, uh, I think it's a myth. But if you go to Cambridge, you go to Trinity College, they even have a small apple tree that they claim is a descendant of the apple tree of Newton. So what happened? So he was a mathematician at Trinity College. And then, I'm sure you know about that, at that time, there was a terrible, terrible pandemic a real pandemic, really, really bad in, uh, in London, what happened? 
what what kind of pandemic came back in Middle Age and wiped out a lot of people? Yes, the Black Death, right? The Black Death. So the so many people died at the time that they sent people home. I guess it was like the, <laughs> like lockdown, the first lockdown, except they didn't have to wear masks and they, they could uh, move freely. But anyway, he was sent home and that's that's when he started to think, okay, over all, all his uh, principles. He had time, he had spare time to develop his uh, principles. Isn't that interesting? So if you like uh, reading, there was a nice, very famous book from Edgar, Edgar Allan Poe, you know, very famous, who wrote about the Black Black Death, the Black Death King. It's a famous book. Okay, so what uh, else did he do? Oh, he also took the telescope, you know, so Galileo, he's the first one, and we'll talk about telescope. But Galileo developed the, the first telescope that he turned to heaven, but it was a telescope made of lenses, you know, the type of lenses that you have. So it's called a refractive telescope. And Newton improved it. He built the first reflective telescope. All the telescopes that we are using today, they are reflecting telescopes. So they use a mirror instead of using lenses, you can use mirrors, and it's Newton who built it. Okay, so really genius. He was really a genius. He's the one who, uh, who understood by uh, doing an experiment, he's the one that said light, it's made of colors, right? So if you take a prism, okay, uh, and, and there is sunshine going through the prism, you're going to see all the colors of the rainbow experiment done by Newton. Okay, that's how smart the guy was. Uh, he was also an alchemist, so that was a thing at the time, you know, play with chemicals. They were all obsessed with uh, trying to turn lead into gold, okay? And he, he, he had this bad uh, habit to leak, you know, to test. <laughs> I guess at the time they didn't have the sensor that we have today. So once he was doing a chemical reaction, it started to leak uh, whatever he was doing. So maybe uh, he was leaking too much lead, but he became insane for one year. Okay, he lost his mind for one year. He became cuckoo for one year. And then he came back to his sense. Um, about light, so at the time, there is two opposite ideas. Newton said that light was made of corpuscles, okay? Um, and why not? We know today that is true, right? Light is uh, both a wave and a particle, a particle wave. So he said it's made of particles. And there was an opposite idea um, proposed by Christian Huygens, so I'm not sure I say the right name because he was Dutch, and he said light is a wave. And if you disagree with Newton, you will be in big trouble, right? He didn't, he didn't like critics, he could not stand critics. So for example, this uh, very famous scientist of the time, his name is Robert Hooke. Maybe you, you, if you take a physics class, you learn about Hooke's law. Robert Hooke was uh, disagree with Newton. So Newton wrote down this very famous quote because uh, Robert Hooke, when he was a child, he, he was born this deformed. Okay, so he, he had like a deformity and he was very small in size. So Newton made, made fun of him and he said that very, very famous quote, if I have seen so far, it's because I am standing on the shoulder of giant. So that was the, the, the type of um, very acidic uh, command. So he said that to make fun of him because he was uh, small and deformed. So it means I'm so smart, you know, I'm standing on the shoulder. Shoulder means I'm so so tall and not deformed. Okay, so that, that was uh, how, how Newton was, didn't like to be criticized at all. And um, another, another thing interesting about him is that, uh, you know, Newton, 
His name is Sir Isaac Newton. Sir meaning he was he was not a noble, he was not born noble, but he was knighted by the king of England. Okay, so like the Beatles were knighted okay, by, by Queen uh, Queen Elizabeth. So he was knighted, not not because all the wonderful physics he uncovered, okay, not because of that, but because he was in charge. Okay, so the king asked him to be in charge of the counterfeiter. So counterfeiter at the time were people who were making uh, fake money, right? So he was he took his job very seriously. And he developed the horrible, such horrible tortures for people who were uh, counterfeiter. So at the time it worked, right? It was a very, um, not, nobody with Newton in charge wanted to counterfeit mo uh, money. Um, uh, he, so he, he reformed the royal mint and that's why he was knighted, okay? Uh, what else about him? So you can go to Trinity College and, and you can see his uh, statue there. I, I went there, I saw that, it was very nice. Cambridge is very nice to visit. And of course, uh, from Newton, physics really became deterministic. Thanks to the physics laws, you could predict anything. Oh, they thought so. Okay, they could predict like if you throw something in the air, like a projectile, you can predict where the projectile will land. Okay, you can even send people to the moon just using Newton's law. So that was a time when physics was deterministic. So it could predict like everything that can happen in the universe. So someone said, uh, natural law hid in the night and God said let Newton be and all was light and then of course it lasted until Einstein came 1905 and everything was upside down because uh, physics cannot predict whatever is going to happen on a very small scale okay so that's called quantum physics so even at a scale of molecules okay at a very small scale, maybe uh, DNA, RNA, all those kind of very, very small things, you cannot exactly predict what's going to happen because it's di dictated by quantum physics, okay? Anything small, the size of an electron, the size of a molecule, you cannot predict anymore, right? So it all comes to probability. So that's why someone said uh, the evil, Right, Devil came and said, let Einstein be, okay, and everything was uh, not deterministic, deterministic anymore. Okay, he died um, in great, great, great pain because he had uh, stones in his uh, bladder, I think. It was very, very, very painful. Okay. Uh, he still died for, uh, uh, at 85 years old. Yeah, from stone in his bladder. Okay, he also had his own ideas. So for example, he didn't agree with the church, right? He didn't believe in the Holy Trinity, which was something for the time. So very interesting uh, life. Any questions? Okay, I didn't lose anyone. And then I want to talk about the heli comet, famous heli comet. So I'm going to show you a video. But um, heli, Edmund Heli is the one who predicted that comet will come back every 76 years. He didn't understand why. That's why he asked his friend Newton, who said it's because of gravity. Okay, so that means the comet is glued to the sun. And it does something like this, right? Slow, 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 and speed up and slow and speed up. Okay, so I don't know if I if I go back to my slide here. Um, you can see here, comet, heli comet. Last time it was 1986. I don't think you were born, but 1986, I was your age. 
Okay, so it came to visit us, and now it's really, really, really far away. The farthest it can be, 20, uh, 24, it's there. When it will be back, it will be in 2061. Probably I, I will not be around, maybe, I don't know. But um, 2061, you will be around, right? So that uh, helicomet comes from the, this part of the solar system, which is called the Kuiper Belt. Okay, so it looks like a donut, and it takes 76 years for the comet to go around along an ellipse, extended ellipse. Is that clear? So it was seen over in, in history many times, and I'm, I'm going to talk about that, but I have a video for you. Let's see. If you have any questions, let me know. Do you see a video somewhere? Here. Halley is the most famous comet, captured by Jupiter into a short period orbit 200,000 years ago. Since then, Halley has returned to our skies on average once every 76 Can you hear? Hi, years. Halley's ellipse brings it from beyond the orbit of Neptune when farthest from the Sun to within the orbit of Venus when closest to the Sun. At its last appearance, Halley moved through our skies like this, on its way to the Sun, late in 1985, and back out in early 86. Halley appeared in medieval skies when in 1066 the Normans conquered England, this from the Bayeux Tapestry. Halley was the star of Bethlehem in Giotto's fresco, He'd seen the comet in 1301. That comets are periodic and return was predicted by Edmund Halley. He saw the comet in 1682. Halley's comet, as it became, was first photographed on the return of 1910. And when it reappeared in the 80s, the space age had a welcome. An international armada headed for a rendezvous. Two probes were Russian, two Japanese, and one, named Giotto after the painter, European. Giotto flew closest of all, right through Halley's coma, the halo of gas and dust that vented from an icy nucleus, 16 kilometers by 9. Okay, so I'm going to talk about Halley Comet. Uh, interestingly, there is another comet very famous that was called the Great Comet of 1577, and it was very nicely described by Tycho Brahe, who impressed everyone. He came to be very famous because he was so good at observing the sky, including the motion of Mars, as we discussed. And he also described that great comet. So that great comet is not the comet uh, Halley. It's a comet that sometimes it happens. Sometimes comet they visit once, and then maybe they're going to be disturbed by junk or, or, or Jupiter, and then they never come back. Okay, Halley com comet, uh, comet has been coming back. The first picture, like a drawing of a comet, happened in... Um, let me go back to the website. Okay, so this is a very famous drawing, okay, of a comet that's Halley Comet, and that was draw, drew, he drew this comet in 1531, right? So it's a long time ago. It's a very famous picture because you see, okay, that he understood or he saw, he described it very nicely that the tail of the comet is always away from the sun on, on its path. Always, the it's because the sun has like a wind, it's called a solar wind that pushes away the tail, okay? Can, let's talk about Halley. 
because it has to do with uh, France and everything. Uh, with France is nice. No, <laughs> it's just uh, very famous. So the first time that we have a record of this comet is inside the tapestry. Okay, so tapestry is like like this. Okay, it was done by women, and they didn't draw at the time. And actually, this tapestry is very famous. It's called the Bayeux Tapestry, and it tells uh, the story of the Duke of Normandy. William the Conqueror, very famous, who came and conquered England. So he became the king of England. Okay. So because of William Conqueror for a, for a while, England was actually French. So very interesting about William the Conqueror. So he was the Duke. You know, if you have another uh, picture here, the Duke of Normandy. So Normandy is in the north of France. So all he had to do is to cross the English Channel okay, between France and England, and he invaded England. Okay, and he killed um, the 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 king at the time in England was named uh, Harold. Okay, King Harold and all all his army. For the credit of Harold here. Uh, the king of England, they just uh, were finished with another war with uh, Denmark, or I forgot which country. So the army were um, didn't have the motivation, they were exhausted, they were very tired, and that was an opportunity for the king of France. He was not the king of France, he was a duke, duke of uh, Normandy, okay, William the Conqueror. Interestingly, which I do not understand to this day, is that in French, um, William is Guillaume. So if uh, if you take French, for example, the name of that duke was Guillaume le Conquérant, and you translate that in English by William, William the Conqueror. Okay? So anyway, um, the battle, if, if you like history, I know some people ask me questions about history, but um, it's, it was a very, very famous battle. Okay, in 10, uh, 10, 10 something, so 10, 1081, so it's well, it was really the Middle Age, early Middle Age, and it's called the Battle of Hastings. It was very, very bloody. And uh, the battle, of, the story of the battle is uh, in uh, 10, 1066, right? It's told in that tapestry. So that tapestry, if you like art, is like amazing for Middle Age. You see, um, it was done over several years by women um, who were, you know, doing this all day long. And you can see all the details. And it's very important because that way we 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 know how how they were dressed and what was happening at the time. You see all those people dead here. So it's called the Tapestry of Bayou. So if you go to France, and you go to Normandy, there is this uh, amazing museum where you can see it. So if you are in art, you know, it's uh, very interesting. So why I'm talking about that, I'm talking about that because for the first time, the comet here, yeah, heli comet was displayed the first time. So if I ask you for the test, where was it displayed for the first time? Is it in a painting? Is it in a drawing? No, it was in a tapestry. 1066, right? So it was the Duke of Normandy who invaded um, invaded England. And as I've said, it, it, uh, last time was 1986. That's when they sent spacecraft to analyze the com comet. And now it's there, so it's very far away from us, so beyond Neptune. Okay, so this is Pluto. Remember, Pluto belongs to the Kuiper belt, so it goes back to Kuiper belt and then it comes back to visit us. So it's going to be slow, uh, speed up, slow down, speed up, slow down. Okay, any, any interesting uh, um, question? So if you are in art, of course, you know I'm not... Not sure how to say his name, Giotto, Giotto, Giotto. It's a, Italian, of course. You can see that in a museum. I don't know if it's in uh, Florence or um, in, somewhere in Italy. So it's a very famous painting of uh, adoration of the Magi. I'm not 
I'm not sure if I say that right also, but 1305, okay, in 14th century. And in this very famous painting, you can see, you can see uh, the comet. So he used, he used the comet, heli comet, as a model for the star of Bethlehem. So it's a very famous painting. And uh, that's why the European, when they built the spacecraft to visit Heli Comet in 1986, they, they name it uh, Giotto af after the, the painter. Anyone is in art? Do I say it right, Giotto? No? I hope I say it right. Okay, so you see this comet comes, comes from the Kuiper belt. Okay, any questions so far? So another step, next step in history, I'm going to talk about William Herschel. So now we are in the early uh, 19th century, and he's the first one who built. Here we go. I'm sure they, they use some kind of chemicals. <laughs> so uh, the first the first huge telescope. Okay, because we're gonna learn that telescope bigger is better. If you have a very, very large telescope, you're gonna have a better resolution. And a brighter image. And at the time, telescopes were very, very expensive. So he did that on his own. He crafted telescopes, right? He was not a scientist by trade. He was actually a musician. So at the time, you know, when you had an army, for example, you had a professional musician going with the army to boost the mood of, of the soldiers. So with his dad, they, they were playing music. And first he was a very good musician, and then he changed to astronomy. He became very passionate about astronomy. So he went from low, low class to be very famous, and at the end, at the end, he was not born wealthy, but at the end, he was, uh, his patron was the King George, King George of England. I think it was uh, George the Fifth. They keep always the same name. I think the new king of England is also named George. I'm not sure. So, yeah, we'll talk about that next time. Um, 